I V M. I want to thank Intel for supporting our show. We're all loving working from home, but let's be honest, there are complications. For example, getting help from IT folks if your PC is down can be challenging because you can't just walk up to them anymore. Well, you'll be happy to hear that I have a solution for you, the Intel vPro platform. The platform comes packed with Intel Active Management technology that lets your IT teams remotely manage your systems and fix the problems without having to go to them. So it means more time getting your work done and less time spent on getting support. Visit intel.in slash more with vpro, that's vpro, to discover how you can do more of what you want and less of what you don't. If you're listening on the IVM Podcast Android app, click the link that's visible to you now. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like bringing fresh perspectives to Indian affairs and Indian perspectives to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to All Things Policy. I am Manoj Keval Ramani and today I have with me Aditya Ramanathan and Nitin Pai. And we are going to be talking about the geopolitics of the COVID-19 vaccine. This is this elusive thing that everybody is now working towards, given that the pandemic um, has been on for a few months now and we're expecting more waves of the virus. The virus is not going anywhere. So while countries reopen... There's lots of caution and you can't really safely reopen and do things like we used to until we have a vaccine. But this is going to be a deeply political issue. Uh, some people have written about this as the next sort of Sputnik moment or a moment in which, uh, you know, countries are going to be competing for the next breakthrough in technology and the vaccine would be sort of spurring that. Um, so, Nitin, I want to sort of begin with you. Um, you wrote a piece recently talking about the geopolitics of this. How does one sort of conceptualize this? You know, we commonly think of the fact that this is about humanity and, you know, uh, this is going to be a shared good where everybody needs this because everybody is so interdependent. But there's much more to this, right? It's much more complicated than that. Yeah, in geopolitical terms, I would compare this with uh, the Manhattan Project or the invention of intercontinental ballistic missiles. In the sense that the side that acquires the vaccine first gets a tremendous, unprecedented uh, advantage, strategic advantage over the others until the others get hold of the, the same things. So uh, while we would all prefer to be in a world where we think of ourselves as uh, citizens of the world, and the coronavirus pandemic as a threat to humanity as a whole, and therefore everybody should uh, get access to the vaccine at the same time, I think as long as there are sovereign states, you will see this competitive instinct uh, and the temptation to use the vaccine to attain relative advantage. And relative advantage is all that matters in international relations. So for those of us who look at the world as international relations analysts, especially those of us who are realists, this is a very dark world. You know, we would like to live in a world where there is cooperation, but in a world of sovereign states, competition and the desire to go one up on your adversary is really always there. And we have to guard against it. So as we're looking right now, what we've seen uh, in the last few months is that we've seen uh, the World Health Organization talk about this. We've seen uh, the Chinese President Xi Jinping speak to the World Health Assembly. And he made this really strange claim where he said that, you know, when China develops a vaccine, it'll be a global public good. Although it's not really clear what he means when he says that the Chinese officials have sort of gone back and said this again and again. Um, and essentially, this is a race between the Chinese and the Americans from the way I see it. Um, but there's going to be much more, com sort of many more components to this in terms of other countries, which uh, might not be necessarily competing in terms of developing that initial vaccine, but in terms of manufacturing, how they deploy it. How do you sort of conceptualize this? And we'll also try and look at how India sort of fits into all of this, given that what is the kind of advantage that a country gets when it gets the vaccine first? Yeah. We'll start from that. Yeah, but you know, when Xi Jinping said that uh, about the vaccine, what he said is that uh, once it's available, China promised to declare it as a global public good and that it will share it with other countries. You know, so it's a very you know, it's a very complicated statement. It's not as easy as people think that he's just said that it's a global public good and China will make it available free of cost to everybody, right? So there is a lot of nuance in his statement. And at best, it is a promise to a promise, right? And we can't take that for granted. Now, let's look at the economics of this. Whatever Xi Jinping and Macron and the others might say, the vaccine is not a public good. 
economics defines a public good as something which is the public good which is non-excludable and non-rival. Non-excludable means that you can't really prevent other people from getting access to it. And non-rival means my consumption does not come at the cost of your consumption. In other words, it's non-zero sum. So, for example, the air we breathe is a public good because I can't, I can't prevent anyone else from breathing the same air. And if that if my breathing of the air does not prevent other persons from enjoying the same air or the scenery or, you know, uh, natural beauty, etc. These are all public goods. National defense is a public good. But a vaccine is both rival and excludable. It's a private good. So no matter what world leaders say and how sanctimoniously they say it or how self-righteously some uh, activists want it to be a public good, it is not. It is a private good. And that is the heart of the matter. Because it is excludable, because it is rival, uh, the people who have the vaccine can use the vaccine to exclude others and score political points and uh, assert their ge geopolitical interests by virtue of having access to the vaccine. All right. So at this point in time, I want to bring Aditya in. Aditya, uh, let's look at this, right? Okay, let's look at one country which has got the vaccine. Let's assume it's the Chinese because uh, that's the real sort of, you know, yes, there is concern about the Americans also, but the Chinese is a real game-changing sort of thing in this. Um, let's uh, um, Manoj, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that uh, so, I wouldn't be so sure of that. Because uh, the, the United States under President Trump is probably talking about the same things, although in a different way. They tried to buy out. Uh, they tried to buy out vaccine developers. They struck deals with uh, Sanofi, and uh, the Sanofi CEO came in and said that because the U.S. is one of the co-investors of the vaccine, they'll have the first dibs on the vaccine, thereby creating uh, tension in his home country, France. So I don't think we would we should necessarily look at only the Chinese as possibly uh, defecting in this cooperation game. The United States or any other country can do it as well. No, indeed. I mean, I was taking China just as an example. Um, but the sort of interests uh, for each side are very similar. Um, but okay, so let's just take one country as an example. And let's say they choose to, uh, that country, country A gets the vaccine. Uh, and I think that country sort of now has vaccine and it needs to sort of ramp up production because ideally you'd want to vaccinate a significant uh, number of your people uh, to be able to sort of get the kind of protection that you need. Exclusion, what are the costs of exclusion? Because at the end of the day, you're going to be interdependent with the world economy. Travel will be another component of this. So what are the costs at which exclusion may come at? So there may be geopolitical advantages of trade or harm to his people, but there'll also be costs of exclusion. Right, Aditya? Absolutely. You're right. So actually, if you look at it in, term, in long term interest of a country, the country that trades a lot, has commerce, travel with other countries. Yes, it is in their interest to generally have the vaccine spread out all around the world. But as Nathan points out, there may be an advantage in delaying that. There may be an advantage in seeking leverage there. Now, a country like India specifically is probably better placed than most others for one reason, which is simply that uh, it is one, it is a potential hub for manufacturing a vaccine if it ever comes. And so any country that really wants to scale up production, get as many shots as possible, uh, to its people will probably want to collaborate with India. One possible exception might be China there. But uh, yeah, so I think in that sense, India is at a relative advantage. Uh, as far as uh, vaccinating a large, you know, a large portion of the world, including India, uh, you probably need to get five or six billion people vaccinated all over the world in order to contain this uh, uh, disease, which means that uh, you're going to have to have multiple production nodes all over the world. And uh, not everybody's going to get it uh, first, you know. So one of the, the big questions in this geopolitics is who gets to the front of the line, who gets to the back of the line. Now, this, this exists within countries as well. But uh, I think for, for this podcast, what we're thinking about is uh, how do countries ensure that, uh, that they get that vaccine first? And as Nithin pointed out, you already see Trump trying to do that. He's you know trying to buy out these vaccine makers in the hope that, you know, if a vaccine ever comes about, those, those are first produced for Americans. Uh, I think that uh, for India, we should actually, so while it's great that we are, we're already collaborating, we have Indian companies collaborating on uh, developing these vaccines, uh, you know, you don't know if, if your vaccine candidate is going to be the successful one. So, uh, you know, the moment there is that successful vaccine candidate, uh, it will require Indian government and industry to make a compelling case for why that needs to be produced on Indian territory. 
See, there are two angles to this, right? The first one, I think Aditya's metaphor of the queue or the line is really, really good. Your geopolitical advantage and leverage comes from being able to put other people in the line and giving them token numbers or, you know, allowing them to jump the queue, right? So if you are the person who can control how the queue moves, you have leverage. And that's exactly what happens to a country uh, that has access to a vaccine. Now, Aditya point made a very interesting point about vaccine manufacturing. I think India is one of the world's largest manufacturers of vaccines. I think 70% of the world's vaccines are manufactured in India. Um, but um, in the COVID race, we don't really have horses of our own. We have partnerships with foreign uh, entities which are developing the vaccine. So the vaccine developer and the vaccine manufacturer are two different things. We don't have vaccine developers. We have vaccine manufacturers uh, in the in the fr- forefront. So it can theoretically happen that the vaccine developing country can say that all the vaccine that is manufactured in India belongs to that country. In other words, they are ahead of us in the queue and we have to wait until they are ready. And it, it could also be that the country will nationalize the vaccine uh, manufacturer or the vaccine product, in which case the decision to take the vaccine uh, away from us, although produced in India, can be a sovereign decision of another country. So these are possible. I don't think we should uh, exclude these from the realms of the possible, which means you really have to have your own vaccine. You need to have your own vaccine developer, right? We do have some uh, entries in the ranks of people shooting towards a vaccine, but none of India's uh, vaccine development uh, efforts are in the top 10 or even the top 20, right? So we're further down the queue, in, in further down the race when it comes to developing our own vaccine. Now, in these circumstances, the best that we can hope for is that the partnership between the vaccine developer, which is a foreign entity, and the vaccine manufacturer, which is an Indian entity, allows us equal access or at least preferential access. And at worst, uh, allows us to be in a non-denial regime. In other words, we can't be denied the vaccine because we are part of the manufacturing partnership. Yeah, I, I, just to add to that, I mean, you, you really hit upon something there because, you know, while obviously countries that have established biotech industries have, have you know, uh, have financial backing, uh, obviously have some degree of advantage, we are in uncharted territory here, which means that uh, the country that actually develops a successful vaccine doesn't necessarily need, need to be this big geopolitical power. So suddenly you could find a fairly small country or even India uh, in that position of advantage. That's right. And uh, having access to the uh, vaccine till the till, till such time that you are the only one with that uh, vaccine gives you mileage, gives you leverage. And I'm sure countries will use it. I would be surprised if there is a country which has access to the vaccine first and doesn't use it for its uh, to promote its national interests. Now, promoting the national interest does not always have to be a nefarious, sinister affair, right? It could be used to uh, extract promises. It could be used to get your way uh, through some other in some other domains. Uh, and that's fair game in international relations. So, I mean, the vaccine is still some way away. I mean, the earliest that we're talking about is, and we've got this internal bet going on, right? Where you said, Nitin, that before the end of the year, uh, we'll get a workable vaccine, which is available publicly, right? That's right. Okay. So, uh, even that's sort of six months away. Um, in the interim, uh, how do we see sort of countries jockeying, knowing that this is one inflection point that could be arrived at, uh, whether it's with the Americans, whether it's with the Chinese, whether it's with somebody else? How do you then sort of, and this sort of obviously creates a lot of uncertainty, right? Because this could then be the case where you need to be nice to people who you think you can potentially have, who might, whom you might have to work with potentially. And so current problems might sort of get, your, your approach to current circumstances might change. Um, so how we sort of, when we see India today, uh, caught in this sort of conflict between the US and the Chinese and also our own issues at the border with China. How do we then sort of approach all of this, keeping this bigger picture in mind? Yeah, see, I think the best we can do and the best most states will do, the best response at this point in time is to insist that the vaccine, when it is available, should be av- uh, made available to everyone in an affordable, uh, in a, uh, equitable, affordable manner, right? It doesn't have to be free, but it should be uh, available to everyone you could say that this becomes a common property of humanity. There's free licensing, uh, royalty-free uh, licensing arrangements, etc. Now, uh, that can happen under the WHO and the World Health Assembly. And in, in a way, that is the best bet for all of us in the sense that if we end up in a situation where vaccine or vaccines are available and are made available to everybody, that's the best bet. That's the best option for all of us, 
right? And I think at this point, uh, diplomacy should still invest in trying to make this come about. Uh, it is also in India's uh, national interest because we produce 70% of the vaccines of the world anyway. So, uh, you know, whoever makes the vaccine, when it comes to vaccine distribution, it still makes sense for us because uh, Indian, uh, the Indian uh, vaccine industry will still benefit. The Indian population will still benefit. So that's, that should be the first preference for all of us. Now, if that doesn't happen, how will you hedge those bets, right? How will you hedge the bet of you making this a uh, uh, global uh, global thing. This now requires us to have uh, two different approaches. The first approach will be to be very sensitive in figuring out which are the efforts uh, that are rushing to the vaccine, who are, who are you know the the consortiums that are racing towards the vaccine, and can we be part of one of those consortia or one or more of those consortia? Ideally, you would be a member of the U.S. led consortia, a China led consortium, or Israel led consortia, and the Europe led consortia, and etc. Right? Ideally, you will be part of all of this uh, if you can. Now, that might not be easy to do because these are private companies most of the time, and they might have their own uh, commercial strategies uh, and geopolitical strategies at the back. So it's not always possible for you to be in all the camps. And I, I, I think in, India is not in all the camps, maybe in one or two. And then the next thing you would do is scale up your own vaccine development uh, capability. Now, India is special in that re regard because we do have that capability. It's not uh, uh, as exciting and as world competitive as uh, the manufacturing sector is. But the development sector is interesting. So we must redouble effort to develop our own uh, coronavirus vaccine. Because even if, you know, you're not the first, uh, you will have a horse in the game. And you will, you know, even if uh, you are denied these vaccines, the ability for you to synthesize your own vaccine at some point in time gives you a certain amount of security in this game. Now, uh, which of these should we do? Our answer is all of the above. Uh, you have to hope that uh, it becomes a global uh, public good, <laughs> to, use a, to use a term which these guys are using. You hope that it becomes globally affordable and available, but you hedge against that by doing some other things. Yeah, I think I'm going to come to you for a bit on that, but I just wanted to sort of point out some of these, uh, some of the data points. So uh, based on what the WHO is saying, uh, out of the top 10 sort of vaccine candidates which are being tested on people around the world, five are either Chinese government or owned by Chinese companies, uh, including one by the Chinese military. Just in fact, the day that we're recording today, there was a report about uh, Sinovac Biotech which is a Chinese vaccine maker, which said that it had sort of cleared phase one and phase two of clinical trials, its vaccine, um, and had shown so-called, uh, quote-unquote, positive preliminary results. So there's a serious sort of race going on, and that sort of complicates the policy options even at this point of time. So uh, given that there is uh, uh, an issue in terms of uh, where this sort of plays out uh, in the six, six, eight months down the road. How do we sort of hedge our bets right now? And also, what can we do in terms of our uh, manufacturing, anticipating that there could be, you know, some sort of a boom coming down the road because, you know, you might end up getting in these manufacturing agreements. So how do we sort of make sure that that setup is in place? Or is it already in place and we don't need to necessarily ramp up? Oh, no, no, we definitely need to ramp up. Uh, just to meet, uh, so, you know, India meets its own vaccine needs. As well as, so present, at present, India meets both its own current vaccine needs, those are for existing diseases and so on, as well as, ex, you know, it exports to other countries. Now, if, if we have to develop a COVID-19 vaccine, we can't stop producing those vaccines, right? So we'll be producing what we already produce and we'll have to ramp up capacity. So that capacity ramp up, I think, has to be done already. Uh, and, you know, this has to be, to some extent, it has to be pushed by the state, uh, though, you know, Market incentives will matter, but uh, I think that in the end, you know, you can you can think about which, which horse you want to back and so on. But ultimately, you don't know what's you know who's who, who's going to come up with the with a successful vaccine first. The question then is when when it's clear that there is a successful vaccine or there could be shortly a successful vaccine, we need to uh, get out there and make a compelling case for that vaccine to be produced in India because. You know, uh, once this vaccine's, uh, once we need, you know, once this vaccine is developed, uh, you know, a lot of our old IPR rules are basically, uh, they're going to be under a lot of stress and the possession is going to be nine tenths of international law. Uh, so if you actually have physical possession of the ingredients required to make the vaccine, you have the know-how, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the midst of a pandemic, you can just ignore all that and, and just make the vaccine. So I think that India will need to plan 
right away about how it's going to gear up to produce. Uh, it's going to have to have a diplomatic strategy in place for making that case for the vaccine to be produced in India. All right. Okay. So this has all been very, very dark in some ways, like Nathan said. Uh, uh, but I'm going to try and end with uh, that positive and uh, sort of hopeful note that Nathan has in his mind where he talks about the fact that we will get a vaccine before the end of 2020. Nathan, I want you to explain to us why do you believe that? <laughs> I've been I've been asked this many times. Uh, and uh, because I went out on a limb fairly early and said, look, we're going to have this vaccine fairly early. Now, I'll tell you why. Uh, very few people have uh, factored in Moore's law when it comes to vaccine development uh, in the last 15 to 20 years. From the time we saw SARS, which was 2003 and 4, uh, to now, uh, we've had multiple cycles of Moore's law. So uh, an average computer is probably 10 times faster uh, than it used to be uh, in 2004. And uh, at the top end of the of the game, the kind of equipment that is available today to model uh, biomolecules, to model their reactions, to model their interactions are far ahead of what we've seen, uh, in what we've imagined in 2004 or 2010. So because a lot of the work in vaccine uh, research is about identifying the most, you know, the shape of the molecule that will work, the shape of the pattern of uh, proteins on the uh, on the virus or on the antibody this is all modelable right and the availability of computing power to the kind of uh, extent that we have now uh, is transformative right second uh, don't forget now we are also talking about artificial intelligence and so on so when you add the ability to uh, predict the kind of molecules that will work and use them in uh, combination with high amount of processing power the ability to shortlist vaccines before we even get to the chemistry labs, is much, much, much more than it was even uh, 10 years ago. Okay, that's number one. Number two is because that this is a pandemic on a scale that we've never seen before, the brightest minds in science in almost every country is looking at COVID, right? Whether it's electrical engineers uh, trying to develop ventilators to uh, chemists trying to develop treatments to, uh, you know, bio biological, molecular biologists looking at vaccines. You have, va uh, and vaccinologists looking at vaccines. You have the smartest minds, brain powers of the world looking at this. Government funding is not a, uh, not a problem anymore. Uh, most governments have thrown large amounts of money at, on vaccine research. And a lot of corporate money has gone in. So in, a, in a, that sense, the kind of resources that we've got uh, to tackle this problem are unimaginable. And a lot of people from the vaccine fraternity talk about the AIDS vaccine, which, you know, people tried for 20, 25 years and really gave up because they couldn't do it, are not looking at it in the context of today. Uh, the AIDS uh, pandemic, when it still existed, still was uh, at the margins of uh, our consciousness, our public discourse, or our healthcare priorities. The pandemic is front, right, and center, right? So... Uh, I think the 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 you know the sum the sum total of the tools that we have, the knowledge that we've acquired in the last twenty five to thirty years, and the prioritization by governments, corporates, and smart people around the world will throw up a vaccine much faster than we think. Now, uh, you know, early data points, uh, the earliest uh, vaccine trials were uh, conducted. I mean, went to uh, went to trial in forty five something days, right? Yeah. Uh, Johnson Johnson has another trial which has gone into human trials uh, as of uh, July, which will go into uh, trial trial of July. Now, that part of it, vaccine development and early testing can easily be done because uh, that can be done on computers and, you know, combination of modeling and small tests, small scale human tests. Is, that is fine. The real, uh, uh, the, you know, the slowest link in this chain are large scale human trials. And you hmm. can't, you know, you can't accelerate that, uh, you know, beyond if, if something says you need to do a one year trial uh, to be sure, then you'll have to spend one year to do that trial. But what I feel is that many countries will take the option of saying, hey, let's not wait for a year. Let's go in for some risk, uh, uh, risk based vaccine deployments. And, uh, you know, voluntarily people might take those vaccines. So I, I think all said uh, before the end of the year, we will have a vaccine. All right. 
but uh, I'm not a religious person, but I would say amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I, let me just add uh, to what Nitin said. A, obviously, I think like all of us really hope Nitin is right on this. Uh, but the other thing is, if there's another note of optimism we can add here, uh, it is that, uh, you know, while I share Nitin's pessimistic worldview or dark worldview uh, about international relations, you know, for a country to, when once it has that vaccine, to decide on the price that it will co- cre- that it will demand from other countries is very difficult uh, because uh, you know that country that has the vaccine still wants to manage its relationships relationship with other countries uh, and you know Nitin talked about the Manhattan Project uh, just to draw from that analogy uh, if you look at you know just the sheer difficulty of conducting nuclear blackmail uh, you know countries don't buy your threat and so on. Uh, I think that something broadly similar might hold for a vaccine. I think that the price that the country with the vaccine can demand will be fairly limited. So hopefully getting to the front of the line will not be such a difficult uh, process. Second, yeah, there, yeah, go on, go on, Aditi. Yeah, no, the only thing, other thing I would, I would add is that India should try it right now and start gaming what that price might be. Yeah. See, if, if you're a country which develops the vaccine, there are four things you could do, right? First is you could freely license a technology and win everybody's gratitude, right? You're this uh, great uh, saintly power which gave away, uh, you know, the solution to the world's problems for free and you're, you're going to be loved by everybody for the rest of humanity. Now, the second is it could take a purely commercial route and say that this is a product we have, guys, and uh, it'll, you know, we'll take a non-discriminatory commercial route. And there'll be differential pricing based on whether you're a rich country or a poor country or a middle-income country, which already happens in the pharmaceutical industry, for example. The third is where coercion comes in. They could use pricing, quotas, and queuing selectively, right? And to score geopolitical points or to favor allies and to punish non-allies, right? Or attract non-allies to come on board. So that is the strategic use of it. And the fourth is you could just deny it to your adversaries and say that you're my enemy, I'm not going to give this to you. Now, I don't think the fourth is possible. I don't think the first is likely. Uh, you know, your truth will be somewhere between the second and the third options where uh, there will be a commercial non-discriminatory route with some amount of uh, geopolitical posturing to attract uh, allies or reward your partners. That sounds likely. <laughs> yeah, but you know, I'm not, I'm not, when I wear on, when I put on my international relations hat, I am not an optimist in this at all. I am not. <laughs> all right. Okay. So with that, we're going to call it a day. Uh, thank you so much, Nitin. Thank you so much, Ajit. This has been a fascinating conversation. And I guess um, the months to months sort of down the road will tell us uh, whether uh, we've been right in anticipating what's going to be happening. Yeah. And whether India's vaccine development efforts will get a shot in the arm. <laughs> okay. <right. laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. If you liked our show, Don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app, ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at Takshashila INST. Or our website, takshashila.org.in. I hope you enjoyed that show. I'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Paytm Money and Intel. We appreciate their support. It's been a really fun week, guys. We've had some great episodes on your old favorites. Cyrus says advertising is dead, edges and sledges. Football, football had a really fun episode as well. Definitely do check it out. I'm sure you're going to enjoy yourselves. And thanks for listening, and we hope to catch you again next week. Entertainment is like food for the brain. It's a window to culture and a great way to understand the world around us. The internet has changed what it means to be an entertainer, creating new storytellers with millions of fans. It has spawned a new breed, the story sellers, those behind the scenes creating the business for this ecosystem. They work with brands, platforms and channels who are keen to capitalize on an audience hungrier than ever for more stories. I am Vineet Kanabar and I have a ringside view to how stories are told and sold. On my show, I bring you creators, artists, executives and marketers for a freewheeling conversation around the business of entertainment. 
Tune in to Storytellers and Story Sellers for personal stories, analysis and criticism every Thursdays as I talk to the brightest minds telling or selling great stories today.